God has been good. Amen. God has been faithful and He always was and He always will. And that's why we're here to worship Him and to express our thanksgiving, to express uh, our adoration and to give Him the praise and the worship that He deserves. So as we prepare our hearts and as we prepare our minds, you know, this is church. It's not just uh, another Sunday event. This is where we have fellowship with our one true King, have fellowship with God, have fellowship with our Lord and our Savior. And He deserves all the reverence, right? So if you haven't done so yet, um, let's put our phones on silent so that we can fully just worship God unhindered without any distraction. So I'm going to give you some time to do that right now. And as we get into an attitude of worship, I know this past week, you know, we may have some uh, burdens and baggages that we carry. But now is the time to give it all to him who's in control and who's sovereign and who's got it all down. So I'm going to give this time to you folks. Uh, God has given us access to him through prayer. We can talk to him 24-7. And let's prepare our hearts. Let's prepare our minds. Let's forget about the burdens and the worries of this past week. And let's surrender to him this new week that he's blessed us with. And let's ask him to prepare our hearts and get rid of all the distractions so that we may worship him and we may hear from him today. So this is all about our time with God, our fellowship with him. Yes, Father, you are not some distant God who we need to uh, do all sorts of rituals to reach. You're there readily available. You're there hearing our prayers and even having fellowship with us. So we thank you, Father, for this privilege, for this opportunity that we can fellowship with you, that we can talk to you and we can pray and even hear from you through your word. Father, bless this time. I pray, Father, that everyone present will experience you, will experience your sovereignty and your power. And we ask that you soften everyone's heart so that we may receive your word fully and unhindered. Father, we know that the enemy is here will try to disrupt the worship service. Father, you are all powerful. We know in the name of Jesus that the enemy will flee with just when we, when we mention
mention your name. May this time be all about you. I pray, Father, that you get rid of all distractions. You deserve the reverence, the honor, the respect. We ask that you speak to us in a mighty way as well, in a personal way. May we be edified and equipped to live our lives for you. Father, use the songs that will be played to bring glory to your name and at the same time bring comfort and peace to those who need it. Above all else, Father, may you be glorified in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all rise. And uh, as, we, as we sing these songs, this, this first song is called uh, God is Here. And we believe that, amen? That God is indeed here. He's not far, He's not distant to those who need Him. So let's, let's reach out to Him and let's, let's believe this truth that God is here. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes so that we may see Him. You may fully understand his sovereignty and who God is. Come on, I want to see you clap. May this be your prayer. Open our eyes. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see you. Open our hearts, Lord. We want to know you. Open our ears, Lord. We need to hear you. Jesus, be revealed. Jesus be revealed. God is here. God is here. God is here. God is here. He is here. We draw near to see Jesus face to face. Oh God is here. God is here. God is here. He is faithful. We draw. Open the gates, open the gates, Lord, reveal your glory, open the nations, establish your kingdom, open the heavens, pour out your spirit, Jesus be revealed. Jesus be revealed. Let's sing God is it. For God is here. God is here. God is here. He is able. We draw near to see Jesus face to face. For God is here. God is here. God is here. He is faithful. We draw near. Jesus, oh, Jesus, be
Senhor
this, Lord, there is, there is power in your name. There is hope. We put our trust in you. You're the one who's the only one who is able to set us free from bondage. trust in you. So church, I invite you, if you don't know this song, focus on the lyrics. There's truth in this song. And allow God to minister to you. Allow God to touch your heart. Find peace in Him. Find comfort in Him. Just 
worship so loud If the mountains bow in reference so loud If the oceans roar your greatness so and the earth thank you Lord for loving us thank you for your grace your mercy your compassion thank you for embracing us with your loving arms accepting us in spite of who you in spite of who we are through Jesus Christ oh God receive now the praises of your people and speak to us again in the name of Jesus we pray amen and amen but well, let's give to the Lord a mighty clap offering At this point, we want to uh, send our kids to Sunday school. Thank you, kids, for joining us for worship. 
check mic one, two, one, two, three. <clears throat> check, 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 check. And again, I would like to appreciate our parents, MPBC parents, for bringing your kids to church with you. And also our Sunday school teachers, thank you for your commitment in investing your lives in this small soul's lives. Uh, last Sunday was the turn of Roger and Andy to teach Sunday school. Thank you, thank you guys, thank you uncles. Today is Darlene and Joy Antonio's turn to teach our kids. So they are dismissed now there to our fellowship hall for Sunday school. And I want to greet everyone, a good evening. About just turn to your neighbor and say hi, hello, good to see you. <clears throat> Tonight's sermon is sermon number nine. In our series, mini-series within a bigger series of the life of Joseph. I think this will be our concluding sermon in the study of this life. The life of this Old Testament character, Joseph. Well, Joseph's life, as we have come to learn these past sermons, is a miniature of uh, the human experience and an illustration of the ways of God among human beings. In other words, when you read about the life of Joseph, <clears throat> you will observe human life with all its pain, with all the realities of injustice, with all the people's moral evil deeds against other people, the fallenness of the human race. You observe their slavery. It's the evidence of the fallenness of the human race, and then how the victim overcomes those negative experiences through the proper understanding of the ways of God and how God deals with the human experience. Dear friends, this is the benefit of studying the life of Joseph. So let us read again the same passage we used last Sunday, Genesis chapter 45, Verses 1 to 15. Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you! So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. Then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years, and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. Verse 9, now hurry back to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all the land of Egypt, so come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Goshen where you can be near me with all your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and everything you own. I will take care of you there, for there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, you, your household, and all your animals will starve. Then Joseph added, Look, 
You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that I am really Joseph. Go tell my father of my honored position here in Egypt. Describe for him everything you have seen, and then bring my father here quickly. Weeping with joy, he embraced Benjamin, and Benjamin did the same. Verse 15, Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them. And after that, they began talking freely with him. May the Lord add his blessings upon us through the reading of his word. So dear friends, this passage from verse 1 to verse 15 of Genesis chapter 45 is the climax of the story. Joseph reveals himself to his brothers who understandably were stunned. I am Joseph. And they say, whoa. You know, if you're one of the brothers, you will feel the same. And then he forgives them and he invites the whole family to live with him in Egypt. One sermon was not enough last Sunday, you know, to adequately extract all of the treasures that are found in verses 1 to 15. So here we are going through it again. Let's read again verse 3 to 5. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said to them, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. Verse 5. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. Sold as a slave by his brothers. Suffering an intense level of injustice. Accused falsely by his Egyptian master's wife. Put in prison for a crime he did not commit. You know, dear friends, Joseph had all the reasons to be bitter. He had all the reasons to be angry. You know, to be angry at people, to be angry at life itself. Joseph had all the reasons to be vengeful. But let's read again verse 5, especially the highlighted part here. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This is the key here, dear friends. As the brothers get stunned by the revelation that they were standing there in front of their brother Joseph, Joseph calms their fears with this right theology. A theology, dear friends, which should be ours as well. This theology on the screen that God God sovereignly directs the events of our lives in order to accomplish his purposes. Jesus, uh, Joseph tells his brothers, it was God who sent me here. Wow! Joseph looked beyond human hate. Joseph looked beyond their, his brother's envy. Joseph looked beyond his brother's crime And the injustice. Joseph instead looked and he saw the divine. Joseph saw the divine purpose. You know, Joseph is even able to be thankful for his imprisonment. Just imagine to be thankful. Thank God I was imprisoned. Because without that unjust imprisonment, He would not have met the king of Egypt. Joseph, dear friends, was able to see the good that has come out of the bad. The good that has come out of the evil. And because of that, anger and bitterness 
were conquered. Well, dear friends, evil is still evil, right? Evil is still evil. What his brothers did to him was still an evil act. Injustice is still injustice. The brother's crime was still a crime. Mrs. Potiphar's false accusation was still false. Please say false. It was still false. But God's sovereignty is able to turn people's evil deeds into something good. Can we all just read together what we have on the screen? One, two, three, go. God's sovereignty is able to turn people's evil deeds into something good. Yes, it's true that the ten older brothers, because of their hatred and jealousy, were responsible for sending Joseph in Egypt into slavery, right? They were the ones directly responsible. They sold their brother into slavery. And yes, it's true, they intended harm. They wanted to get rid of their brother. They didn't want anything of him. But God was ultimately behind all of those events. And by God's power, by God's sovereign rule over our human affairs, he had worked it out for good. Joseph said, it was God who sent me here. Wow, dear friends, this is proper theology. This is proper theology guiding how a man, how a person responds to the events of his life. It was God who sent me here, he said. And brothers and sisters, we need to develop this same kind of perspective in our lives. We need to cultivate this. We need this, this kind of mindset as we take a look at the things that are happening in our own individual lives. Our ability to see God's hand behind our life events determines whether we will be happy or bitter. I want to say that again. Our ability to see God's hand behind our life events determines whether we will be happy or bitter in our lives. Dear friends, Joseph here is an example of a godly character that every Christian must imitate. Joseph was human, amen? He was human. Joseph had human feelings. And so we have this question tonight. Could Joseph have felt angry? Question, yes or no? Could Joseph, when he was sold into slavery as a 17-year-old, bound, tied up, placed there on a, maybe on a cart, and he was just screaming, set me free, please, have mercy on me. Was he, and could he have been angry? When he was unjustly thrown in prison, could he have felt angry? Well, if you see the story, it's not in the record. But it is safe for us to imagine that Joseph did. It is reasonable for us to imagine, dear friends, that Joseph felt all these emotional, human anger due to his possession of a normal human nature. He was not superhuman. He was human just like all of us. So it is safe to think that, yes, Joseph could have normally felt angry. Raise your hand if you have never been angry in your life. Yay! We're not alone. But to remain angry, to remain the word there is remain. To remain in a state of anger, dear friends, is the real issue. And as we have read in the story, Joseph did not. So we ask the second question, how did Joseph overcome anger? How did he conquer bitterness? Dear friends, 
Here's the answer. Joseph must have been living close to God all these years that he was in Egypt. Repeatedly, as you remember the story, repeatedly in the story we have read that God was with Joseph. And it is safe to say that the reverse was also true. The story says several times, the story says God was with Joseph. When he was in the household of Potiphar as the servant, as a slave, God was with Joseph. When he was thrown in prison, again we read, God was with Joseph. But dear friends, it is also safe for us to say that the reverse was true, that Joseph was with God. In other words, Joseph walked with God. Joseph maintained a close relationship with his God, with Yahweh. Joseph maintained his intimacy with God. Because how else could you explain How else could you explain such a godly response in spite of all the offenses that were done against him? Dear friends, Joseph must have been drinking, so to speak, from the fountain of mercy. Joseph must have been reclining on the heart of God to have so much mercy and love to offer to his offending brothers. So he is an example of a godly character that every one of us need to imitate. Like Joseph, let us cultivate the habit of seeing God behind the events of life. I want just to speak to you tonight, whatever it is that you're going through at the moment, it is good to ask, what is God's purpose behind this. Let us cultivate that habit of seeing the hand of God, of seeing God behind the events that are happening in our life. Maybe you're struggling with something tonight. Maybe you're struggling with pain tonight. Maybe you're struggling with something problematic in your life, in your family tonight. Whatever it is that you are going through at the moment, It is good for the Christian to ask, what is God's purpose here? What is God's purpose behind all of these? Now let's read again verse 4. Let's continue with our study of verse 4. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. I want to highlight this part of the verse. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. You see, dear friends, Joseph had the option to just decide and keep himself hidden from his family forever. He had that choice. He could have just, you know, just decided, ah, I'm not going to show myself anymore to them. I'll just, he could have just thought, I'll just disappear from them forever. You know, he is the offended party. He is the grieved party. And he could have just remained gone forever. But no, dear friends, Joseph took the initiative. Please say, initiative. Initiative. The offended party took the initiative to meet the offending party. Now you might be thinking, why is this even on the screen? Why is that even significant? Dear friends, Joseph, the aggrieved party, the one against whom the brothers have sinned, he was the one who took the initiative. Instead of choosing to be gone forever, Joseph chose to take the initiative to offer reconciliation. He took the initiative to offer peace, to grant forgiveness. You know, dear friends, this is the message of the gospel. The offended party took the initiative to meet the offending party. 
This is the message of the gospel. You know, dear friends, because of our sinfulness, because of human rebellion, because of our disobedience, God is the offended party. God is the aggrieved party. But instead of leaving us alone in our sins, instead of allowing us sinners to be lost forever, God took the initiative. In love, by His grace and mercy, God took the initiative to reach down from heaven to our lost humanity. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And then we love God because He first loved us. Dear friends, this is the uniqueness of Christianity. Please say unique. Christianity is unique. Christianity is unique among the many religions of the world. Maybe you're asking, how, pastor? How? How is Christianity unique compared to the many religions of the world? You know, on our screen, all other religions instruct people to reach up to their God by their own efforts. In contrast, Christianity is the only religion where it is God who reaches down to people. I want to read that again. All other religions instruct people to reach up to their God by their own efforts. In comparison, Christianity is the only world religion where it is God who reaches down to people. What are, what are the world religions that you are aware of, that you know? Examples of world religions? Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, even Buddha, yeah, Buddhism, even Judaism. You know, dear friends, these religions teach a works-based system. Please say works-based. Again, works-based. Thank you. Meaning, works-based, meaning their practitioners observe a system of what to do and what not to do. It is works-based or deeds-based, wherein, in the end, you are judged whether you have been, quote-unquote, good enough to merit the favor of the divine. So other religions tell people, try hard, try harder, do good, do better, or do your best. Abstain from this, abstain from that, avoid this, avoid that. You know, dear friends, it is, it is man doing everything in his capacity to try to reach God. Sometimes in vain. Oftentimes, always, in vain. Christianity, in comparison, is different. Christianity teaches the blessed truth that it is the merciful God who reached down to man. And God did that through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus came into the world, the God-man. God in the flesh, God incarnate. Jesus lived a perfect life. Then he died on the cross as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of man. And it is by believing in him. Please say believe. It is by believing in Him, Jesus Christ, and accepting everything that He has done, He has accomplished on our behalf, that we are justified and made right and accepted before God. You see, it is Jesus who did the doing. That's the difference in Christianity. Other religions feature a system of do's and don'ts, and the goal of the man, the goal of the person is to win the favor of his God. The goal is to win merits. It is all human striving. But the message of the gospel is different. 
It is the gracious God who took the initiative of reaching out to people. And what man just needed to do was to place his faith in Jesus Christ, who did it all. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, God who came in the flesh. Jesus, the perfect one who took our punishment. Jesus did everything. Please say everything. Everything. He lived the perfect life that a holy God required. Jesus did everything. Then he became the sacrifice to pay the penalty for sins. And our part is to what? Believe in him. Please say believe. And then accept what he has done for us. Joseph, back to the Joseph story. Joseph, the offended party, took the initiative to reach out to his brothers, the offenders. In the same manner, dear friends, God, the offended party, became the one who reached down, took the initiative to reach down from heaven in order to provide salvation to a lost human race. This is the message of the gospel. Let's continue by reading again verse 15. Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them, and after that they began talking freely with him. So they were stunned. After a brief moment of being stunned by Joseph's revelation, I am Joseph. The stunned brothers finally regained their composure. They were reminded of their sins. Yes, Joseph said, Joseph said, you were the ones who sold me. Yeah, you sold me into Egypt, into slavery, but it was God. It was God. It was all God. For a brief moment, they were standing there scared in front of Joseph. And then they were granted forgiveness. Now, after hearing, after hearing that Joseph had forgiven them of their crime, after receiving their pardon, the forgiven brothers now talked freely with Joseph, with a highlight here. And after that, meaning after they have received pardon, after they have received forgiveness, they began talking freely with Joseph. Him. Now, why are these words important, dear friends? Well, it works for both people and God. And here's our lesson on the screen. Restored communication is the evidence of true reconciliation. Again, I want to say this principle works for both people and God. Let's first talk about people. If you ever had any experience of having a strained relationship with somebody, communication usually is the first one to get affected, right? If, if, if you have a, the experience of having a strained relationship with somebody, it's communication that gets affected first. You do not talk. Or whenever you talk, it is to argue or to fight. But usually, what prevails during times of a strained relationship is the absence of communication. People stop talking to each other. Here, in the Joseph story, there's a mention of a restored communication. Please say, restored communication. Okay, one more time, as loud as you can. Restored communication. communication. Thank you. And this, dear friends, is the evidence that true reconciliation has taken place. Dear brothers and sisters, we cannot say that we are good with people if we don't talk to them. We cannot say that we are now okay. We cannot say, oh, we're we're okay now. But then we continue not to be talking to them. Real forgiveness, real pardon, real reconciliation is demonstrated by the restoration 
of free communication. After that, according to the story, after that, they began talking freely with him. Now, dear friends, this also applies to God. Like the pardoned brothers, the soul that has tasted the sweetness of God's forgiveness is the soul that freely communicates with God. Dear friends, when we have truly understood how much we have been forgiven by God, when we have fully grasped the true value of our salvation, when we have fully realized and appreciated what it means to have been forgiven by God, then prayer should not be a burden. When we have fully understood, oh, God has forgiven me. I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. I'm a citizen of His kingdom. Reading the Bible is no longer a chore. Coming to church is no longer just a weekend thing. Dear friends, we pray. We read the Bible. We come to church. We worship because we now fully understand the real meaning of how it is to be reconciled, reconciled truly with our God. Restored communication is the evidence of true reconciliation. What this means, dear friends, is this. Only a true Christian is reconciled with God. Amen. Only a true Christian is reconciled with God. Only the true Christian is truly forgiven by God. Therefore, only the true Christian will demonstrate a genuine desire for communication with God. Can we all just, can we all read together as a congregation as loud as we can with conviction? One, two, three, go. Only the true Christian will demonstrate a genuine desire for communication with God. Why? Because the true Christian has the Holy Spirit inside of him. Please say, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. If you are a true Christian, the Holy Spirit of God resides in you. And because the Holy Spirit resides in you, the Holy Spirit will give you that desire to communicate with your God. Because He resides, He lives in you, the Holy Spirit will inspire that in you. The Holy Spirit will give, will give that desire in your heart. Such that, please listen to this, dear friends, we're closing with this. Such that if that restored communication with God is not there, then it is good to question yourself. Have I been truly reconciled with God? If there's no desire in a person's heart, to get in touch with God, that person has to ask himself, am I really saved? If there's no desire in a person's heart to have a restored communication with his or her God, a good question is, am I really a child of God? And with that question, I want to close this sermon tonight as I ask the praise team to please come up the stage again. All, all heads bowed, please. All eyes closed, no looking around. Dear friends, as we close this mini-series on the life of Joseph, and as we continue on with Genturev, I want to close with this challenge tonight. Do you, do you have this genuine desire to communicate with your God, with our God? Do you seek God? Is there this desire 
to be with God, to pray, to read His Word, or even to come to church. You know, if, if that desire is absent, maybe the call for you tonight is to be saved. If you can say honestly, you know what, Pastor? Honestly, maybe what I need tonight is to be saved. What I need tonight is to be to become a child of God first. To be reconciled with God first. And if that is you, I will lead you in this short prayer. And I will just ask you to just follow after me. Father in heaven, I come to you tonight thanking you for taking the initiative. Thanking you for reaching down to me. And I come to you in faith. Tonight, I declare my faith in Christ. And I receive him as my Lord, my Savior. Lord, please forgive me of all my trespasses, my sins. Save me from my sins. Receive me as your child. And place in me, O God, your Holy Spirit, that I may be totally restored unto you. I also want to address those of you who have been Christians for a while, for a long time, maybe for even for many years. And your relationship with God has been shallow, lukewarm. And maybe the Holy Spirit is just tugging at your heart tonight to just Recommit your life to God. To be more intimate and to have a closer devotion unto God. If that is you, I also want to pray for you. Or you may want to follow after me as well. Father in heaven, I come to you, O Lord God, confessing my lukewarmness. I confess to you I have been ignoring you, O Lord. Now I am reminded. I come to you. I want to return to you. Draw me, Lord, unto you that I may find a renewed devotion for you. Grant me, O God, that desire to study your words, to obey your commands, and to live my life serving you, loving you. And this is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Let's all rise as we respond with this song.
for the dexology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures really love. Praise Him above He heavenly hosts. Praise Father Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and, and Lord. Thank you, Lord, for so great salvation that you purchased for us through the blood of His Son. Father, tonight, we want to honor, obey, and worship you. We want to give our offering, our tithes and offering, Lord. And we ask you to, to bless it, Lord, for the needs of this ministry, Maui Philippine Baptist Church. We ask you to bless also all those who participate in their giving, Lord. We ask you to bless our, our work of our hands, our job, and our businesses. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. We ask you, Lord, to bless every one of us tonight and continue to give up a strong body and protection. And thank you, Lord, 
for everything that you have done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all be seated for tithes and offerings. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> for our announcements. We already did that. We're going to call up Micah. For this week's um, birthday celebrants, uh, today, July 31st, uh, Kendra Olbock and Christian Arias. August 1st, Luel Sim. And August 6th, Janel Carrion. Let's sing happy birthday, everyone. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Kendrew, Christian, Lowell, Jano. Happy birthday to you. Um, Sunday school has started, um, so we would like of any parents if you would like to bring their kids every Sunday for Sunday school. Um, I would like to invite any middle school and high schoolers for youth group Fridays at 5 to 7.30 p.m. at Hebron, and we would like to thank our food sponsors. Um, we'd also like to um, invite you guys to join a small group every Days. Um, MPPC is on tightly. Um, it's our way to give our tithes and offerings. Or you can mail it to our PO box at PO box 2046, Carlui High 96733. And our church cleaners for the month is the Balmosena family. Thank you. And I'd like to call up Pastor for our closing prayer. again declare unto you, O God, our dependence on you, our trust in you. We trust you for provision. We trust in you, Lord, for protection, for guidance, direction. And we ask, help us, Lord, to abide in you for the rest of the week until we gather again like this. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you. May God protect you. May He deliver you from the evil one. May God provide all your needs. May He heal all your diseases. And may your lives be a reflection of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Good night. God bless us all. <laughs>